And I've come up here tonight so I can see what my computer's saying. Like I say, we tried to get something interesting for the kids, and all three of them showed up tonight. <laughs> so, anybody out there young at heart, maybe you'll like it as well. You know, they're everywhere. They're on television. Oops, wrong button. They're in the movies, or excuse me, they're on movies, then they're in television. You may remember that show, I do. They're in comic books. They're in science books. And they're for sale. What are they? Well, of course, you know what they are. They're dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are everywhere. Dinosaurs did exist in the past. They're not a figment of our imagination. I was reading something while I was preparing this lesson and the person said God put fossils in there to test our faith. Really? Those things didn't exist? No, they existed. If, if God did that, God would be a liar, wouldn't He? He'd be a deceiver. And we know that God is not that. But whenever you walk into the Dinosaur National Monument and you see the 25-foot long baby Camarasaurus in the rock face, you go to the Smithsonian and you see the various fossilized dinosaurs on display, three of them there. You cannot deny that those animals once lived. There's another picture from the Smithsonian of a Tyrannosaurus rex and then another one of a Brachiosaurus or something like that, but they existed. We know they did, but what is the truth about dinosaurs? Well, Dinosaurs, how about dinosaurs in science? Where did they come from? Where did the dinosaurs come from? You know, the first discovery of a dinosaur was made by Dr. Gideon Mantell in 1822. I believe it was actually his wife found a fossil bone, or excuse me, a fossil tooth. And he identified it as belonging to a huge reptilian creature which he called an iguanodon. Well, since that time, fossil hunters have been made or have made many fascinating discoveries. And people, you know, people were kind of shocked whenever they learned that these huge creatures used to live upon the earth. By 1841, Richard Owen was convinced that there had once been several large lizard like reptiles that once lived. And in 1841 is when the name dinosaur was coined. It comes from two words, two Greek words, danos, which means fearful or monstrous, and saros, which means lizard. So it's a fearful or monstrous lizard. And then remember, that was coined in 1841. Now let's look at dinosaurs and archaeology. Evolutionary scientists try to assign ages of millions of years to the dinosaur fossils, and they try to work out then an evolutionary line of descent for the dinosaurs. They have the dinosaurs first coming around about 200 million years ago, and the last one dying out 65 million years ago. So in other words, evolutionists do not, or excuse me, man did not appear until 3.6 million years ago is what they teach. So according to evolutionary theory, man and dinosaurs could have never lived together at the same time. There's about 62 million years difference in the time that they appeared. Now according to the creation account that we read in the Bible, the dinosaurs were created on days 5 and 6. When you look at Genesis 1, 20-27, it says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open, open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. <clears throat> and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth, and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So the dinosaurs that fly and the dinosaurs that were in the sea were created on the fifth day. Now we get to day six. God said, Let the earth bring forth a living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. 
And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in His own image, in the image of God created He him, male and female created He them. So according to the Bible, some dinosaurs have been here one day longer than man has. But the rest of them haven't created on the same day. So dinosaurs and man lived together until the dinosaurs became extinct, if they have become extinct. So what does the evidence show? What is the evidence concerning the dinosaurs? There are dinosaur and human footprints that have been found together. Now some of these have been proven to be false. And I'm not going to show you any of those. But the ones that I'm going to show you were not proven to be false. Just a few miles southwest of Fort Worth, Texas is the city of Glen Rose, Texas. Outside of Glen Rose, there is what is called a creationist museum. They're just outside the entrance to the Dinosaur State Park there on the Paluxy River. Close by there at Glen Rose, dinosaur footprints were found in the Paluxy River bed. You can go down there and there's a little river running through there and you can see the various dinosaur tracks and as you're wading through the water, you may drop into a hole. That was a dinosaur track. Been there, done that. And then there's some other areas down there where they have the, like this one, the three-toed dinosaur tracks. Well, there was a flood in that region in 1908, and when conditions returned to normal, people saw three-toed dinosaur tracks alongside human tracks. Those are not made up. Those were not carved by human beings. Those are footprints. And you can see the dinosaur print footprints heading this way and the human footprints going that way. And that fellow was walking in those to show how that would be done. The curator of the Creationist Museum at that time, and I don't know if he still is or not, but his name was Carl Ball, and he put out a book named Dinosaur, Scientific Evidence that Dinosaurs and Man Walk Together. I've got this back there in my library. This is from page 30. He says, But the beast was found soon after we unearthed that first dinosaur print. They had discovered an upright dinosaur. They, they found him that way. He said, I moved my trowel carefully as I scraped the surface nearby and struck the proverbial goal. Only seven and a half inches from the dinosaur print nearer to the river, I again felt the clay slightly crack as I probed firmly with my trowel. I penetrated this intrusive material and gently removed it, scraping it until I was up against solid limestone itself. Now we could clearly see a perfectly formed humanoid footprint. I knew that no other being could leave a footprint like a human's, and I was confident that I had in fact discovered, or excuse me, uncovered, a long hidden man's footprint. Even the toe prints could be counted and the shape of the heel was clearly defined. He says, see picture J, that's Picture J, you can see the dinosaur footprint here and the human being's footprint over there, seven and a half inches apart. This is another picture that was taken showing a human footprint up here and a dinosaur footprint down here, 18 inches apart. And now again on page 30, he says, One of our volunteer workers was six foot four inches in height with very large feet. We photographed his foot and he knew the recovered print and they were still about four inches beyond his heel to the indentation made by the heel of this other man from long ago. Think about someone being 6'4", how big their foot's going to be and this foot was four inches longer. Anyway, we'll continue on. He said, we could feel the imprint of the five toes and the man's instep and of his heel. We point out that this human footprint was at the same level as that of Mr. Tyrannosaurus rex. They were contemporary, not separated by a hundred million years or more. They were moving together, probably doing their best to escape the terrifying catastrophe all around them. They were quite clearly at the same level and in fact had traversed a fast-setting rock surface on the same day. Now I didn't give all of the next quotation, but you'll notice that the press was on hand to view every process, or every procedure and the evidence was too clear to ignore. As a matter of fact, on June 17, 1982, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram had basically about a page and a half or a little over a page article on what was taking place down there at Glen Rose. 
This is from page 72 of the same book. During the past 75 years, literally hundreds of dinosaur tracks have been viewed downstream from the excavation site. The Creation Evidences Archaeological Excavation Team has excavated 164 dinosaur tracks with 50 human tracks among them. The team has verified few dinosaur tracks upstream from the site. And this week, when the book was written, Ball announced that dinosaur tracks have been located within 125 feet of the burial site, the burial where they unearthed the dinosaur. Some of these tracks are quite deep with an angle inclining in the direction of the dinosaur burial point. This indicates to the excavators that the creature was laboring under advancing and surrounding amounts of clay and mud. Now, what would that come from? Noah's flood. More than likely, Noah's flood. Now we'll look at some other evidence. Dinosaur drawings on canyon walls. Dr. Samuel Hubbard was an honorary curator of archaeology at the Oakland Museum. He visited an area of the Grand Canyon called the Hava, or excuse me, the Grand Canyon known as Havasupai Canyon twice in the late 1800s. All right, he made his third trip to the canyon in 1924. He found carvings of an ibex, an elephant, and a dinosaur. You see the dinosaur? Right here. And there's all the other carvings around it. Hubbard wrote, the fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories regarding the antiquity of man. The fact that the animal is upright and balanced on his tail would seem to indicate that the prehistoric man must have seen it alive. That's just a cutout of that blown up to give you a better idea of what it looks like. The next one is a petroglyph of a man in the jaws of a dinosaur. There's the dinosaur. Whoops, back up. There's the dinosaur right there. And there's the man. At Natural Bridges National Monument, southeast Utah, on the underside of the third largest natural bridge in the world, there are petroglyphs believed to be from 500 to 1500 years old, to believed to be done by the Anastasi, Anasazi Indians that once lived there. What we're going to look at came from the Kachina Bridge. This is what it looks like. At the Kachina Bridge, a mountain goat, a human figure, multiple handprints, and many other carvings and drawings can be seen easily underneath the bridge on both sides of the span. The most fascinating carving is that of a dinosaur on the right span about 10 feet off the ground. It's not going to be real easy to see right there. There's the man right there, and right in here is where the dinosaur is. The next picture, well, I'll just circle them for you there. The next picture gives you a little blown up idea. Here's the dinosaur and there's the man. The next picture, the color has been enhanced so that you can see what they look like. Now evolutionists came along and they looked at that and said, no, that's a horse. Looks like a horse, doesn't it? I've always, horses' tails always drag the green. But it gives you an idea. But notice it is in an upright walking position. All right, how could humans carve such graphic illustrations of dinosaurs if they hadn't seen them alive? Remember, this was long before 1822. Now, dinosaur engravings, the Khmer civilization, we're looking at Cambodia now, once flourished in Southeast Asia, territory of Angkor. The Hindu and Buddhist kings of the 8th through the 13th centuries A.D. built majestic stone temples. In 1186, King Jayavarman, began building the temple of Tai Prom, which ruins stand today in the jungles of Cambodia. They are intricately carved statues and stone columns that fill the temple monastery. There are animals, people, gods, plants, and many other decorative images carved on the columns. One of the columns is a carving that has a striking resemblance to a stegosaurus. be kind of hard to see right there, but there it is. Here's a picture of it blown up. Looks like a stegosaurus. I know, it's got to be a horse. It's got to be a horse, right? The Carlisle Cathedral, founded in the 12th century in England. Richard Bell, one of the bishops of Carlisle in the 15th century, so we're looking in the 1400s. Records show that he served in that position for 17 years, resigned in 1495, and died in 1496. 
His body was laid to rest in a tomb along the main aisle inside the cathedral. On the edge of Bell's 500-year-old tomb is a natural strip of brass on which various animals were engraved, including a bird, a fish, a dog, and a pig. There are also two animals that have long necks and long tails that resemble dinosaurs. There they are. Right there. All right, how could someone engrave these dinosaurs in brass 300 years before the fossils were even found? And again, they're in a lifelike position. Now we're going to look at some dinosaur figurines. In 1945, an archaeologist by the name of Waldemar Julsrud discovered clay figures buried in the foot or at the foot of El Toro Mountain on the outskirts of Ab uh, see, uh, Cambaro, Mexico. Eventually, over 33,000 ceramic figurines were found in the area and identified with a pre-classical Chepecuaro culture about 800, to 800 B.C. to 200 A.D. Along, or among his find were figures that were lifelike poses of dinosaurs. Dr. Ivan T. Sanderson was amazed in 1955 to find there was an accurate representation of a brachiosaurus almost totally unknown to the general public at that time. Sanderson wrote, This figurine is a very fine, jet black, polished looking wear. It is about a foot tall. So these were not small things. The point is, it is an absolutely perfect representation of a brachiosaurus known only from East Africa and North America. There are a number of outlines of the skeletons in the standard literature, but only one fleshed out reconstruction that I have ever seen. This is exactly like it. And these are some of the pictures of the figurines that were found there. There's another. I mean, there's just some of the many. This picture gives you an idea of how big some of these figurines really are. And how could someone who had never seen one alive do something like that? Now, dinosaurs, you know, there are stories all over the world about dragons. Ancient people all over the world have those unusual stories about fire breathing, reptile like creatures that once roamed the earth, and they called them dragons. Well, legends are almost always based on some facts, not just imagination. Dragon legends and pictures can be found in Africa, India, Europe, the Middle East, the Orient, and every other part of the world. Here's one from Babylon. A hero named Gilgamesh traveled to a distant land to cut great cedar trees needed for his city. He reached the forest with 50 volunteers and discovered a huge reptile-like animal that ate trees and reeds. Gilgamesh killed it and cut off its head for a trophy. Here's one from France. The city of Nurluk was renamed in honor of killing of a dragon there. The animal was described as bigger than an ox and had a long or had long, sharp, pointed horns on its head, possibly a triceratops. In Europe, well-known old science book, the Historia Animalium, I see, Animalium claims that dragons were not extinct in the 1500s, but were extremely rare and relatively small by then. In Italy, a scientist named Ulysses Aldrovandus carefully described a small dragon seen along a farm road in northern Italy on May 13, 1572. Remember, Columbus discovered America in 1492. A few years later, wasn't it? The creature was small enough that a farmer killed it with his walking stick. The animal had only hissed at the farmer's oxen as they approached the road. The scientist got the dead body and made measurements and a drawing and had it mounted for a museum. It had a long neck, very long tail, and a fat body. The skeletons of a number of ancient reptile-like creatures match that description. And here's what Aldrovandus wrote. The dragon was first seen on May 13, 1572, hissing like a snake. He had been hiding on the small estate of Master Petronius near Docius in a place called Mal... Malona, Mona, Malonalta. Try to get that out. At 5 p.m., he was caught on a public highway by a herdsman named Baptista of Camaldulus near the hedge from a private farm a mile from the remote outskirts of Bologna. 
Baptista was following his ox cart home when he noticed the oxen suddenly come to a stop. He kicked them and shouted at them, but they refused to move and went down on their knees rather than move forward. At this point, the herdsman noticed a hissing sound and was startled to see this strange little dragon ahead of him. Trembling, he struck it on the head with his rod and killed it. Aldrovandus was surprised that the reptile did not run when he saw the man, but instead bravely raised its head and stood its ground. All right, another one. On April 26, 1890, the Tombstone Epitaph, that's an Arizona paper, reported the two cowboys had discovered and shot down a creature described as a winged dragon, which resembled a pterodactyl, only much larger. The cowboy said its wingspan was 160 feet, and the body was more than 4 feet wide and 92 feet long. The cowboy supposedly cut off the end of the wing to prove the existence of the creature. The paper's description of the animal fits the Quetzalcoatlus, whose fossils were found in Texas, and this gives an idea of how big the Quetzalcoatlus was, about the size of a giraffe in height. Now we'll look at the Ica burial stones. Dr. Javier Cabrera started collecting stones in the 1930s, collected most of the 11,000 Ica stones that are in the Ica Stone Museum in Ica, Peru. Ica, Peru is located right there, almost on the Pacific coast there of Peru. Depicted on the stones are what appears to be relics of an ancient Indian culture that predates the Incas. Many of the carved stones show mundane scenes that be expected in any ancient culture. But some of the stones show humans in close contact with dinosaurs. Now some of these were taken, well, I'll, I'll let you read it later. Here's some of the pictures. Dinosaurs in lifelike doing things, standing up. I know you can see a plant eater, a meat eater, and there's a triceratops, and there's a pterodactyl. This one, that guy I don't think has a chance. He's got one dinosaur biting him on the neck and another about to eat his leg. This one, the guy's riding the dinosaur. That guy there is in trouble too. He's about to be eaten, it looks like. As is that one. Well, are they real or are they fake? That was the question. Evolutionists say every one of them is a fake. And some of them may be. But what you're about to see comes from www.creationliberty.com. He says a Peruvian jail sentence is almost the same as an American death sentence. They don't feed you, they don't clothe you, they don't help you in any way. If your family does not come to give you food and assistance, you will die in a Peruvian jail. Selling Peruvian treasures without government authorization is against the law, so when police officers brought in Irma, these are two people that were selling these, and Basilio, both said they made the stones and sell them. So they said they made them. Because if the two confessed to digging up the stones and selling them, they would be immediately thrown in Peruvian jail. Even Philip Coppins, who writes against the authenticity of the Ica stones, admitted the contradicting testimonies. He said when Von Doniken visited the farmer in 1973, Ushuya confirmed to him that he had faked the stones. But later on in an interview with the German journalist Andreas Fischer, Ushua claimed the opposite. They were genuine, he insisted, and he admitted to a hoax to avoid imprisonment. And whenever they took them in for testing, they were found that they had the patina and everything that would match something that old. And he continues to say there's still a lot to be learned by the Ica stones, but few people are willing to pay for the research because after all, these stones completely destroy the general theory of evolution. Who would want to pay for research that destroys the only presupposition evolutionists have to help them reject true biblical history? Evolution is a multi-billion dollar industry in books, DVDs, government contract and grants, etc., so who would want to pay to destroy that industry? They don't want to destroy their own industry. Now I want to look at dinosaur carcass caught in a fisherman's net. April 10th, 1977, a Japanese fishing ship, the Zuiyo Maru, 
caught the decaying body of a large, strange reptile in 900 feet of water near Christchurch, New Zealand. Photographs, measurements, and tissue samples all show that it was probably one of the great marine reptiles like the Pleosaurus. The animal was 32 feet long. And let me see, one, two, three, four. Two pews behind Bruce Higgins over there is 32 feet from the front of the table. Give you an idea of that. 32 feet long and weighed about 4,000 pounds. It had four fins that were each about three foot long. The director of animal research at the National Science Museum of Japan said, It seems that these animals are not extinct after all. It's impossible for one to have survived, for only one to have survived. There must be a group. These are some of the pictures of that. They did not take it back with them because they were a fishing ship and they didn't want to ruin their cargo. They'd have probably made a whole lot more money if they'd have brought that back with them. Well, the evolutionists will look at that and they will say that, that that's a basking shark. That's the remains of a basking shark. That's a basking shark. That's a basking shark that's been beached. So whenever you look at that, what does it look more like? A basking shark or a pleosaurus? There's the, a fossil of a pleosaurus. Again, these are other pictures that were taken. The Japanese government didn't think it was a basking shark. They made a stamp to commemorate the catch. Not of a shark, but of a dinosaur. So, dinosaurs and humans did live together at the same time. But why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? Are they there? Well, remember the word dinosaur is not found in the Bible, but there are animals that are in there that are the description or fit the description of dinosaurs. You should remember that the word dinosaur was not invented until 1841. King James Version written in 1611. There is a thing called a behemoth though in the Bible. That word is found one time in Job 40 verse 15. When you look at verses 15 to 24 it says, Behold now behemoth which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox, low his strength is in his loins, his force is in the navel of his belly. Verse 17 is very important. It says, He moveth his tail like a cedar. So his tail is huge, like a cedar tree. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He's the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees and the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about, which means surround. Behold, he drinketh up a river. He hasteth not. He's not concerned. He trusteth. He can draw up Jordan into his mouth. He taketh it with his eyes. His nose pierceth through snares. If you look at those that have a footnote at the bottom, they'll say it's an elephant or a hippopotamus. How big is an elephant's tail and a hippopotamus's tail? Little bitty things. They are not like a cedar tree. Another creature mentioned in the Bible is the Leviathan. Leviathan is mentioned a few times, mainly in Job 41. And it is described as the greatest creature in the sea. Unlike a crocodile, this is what they say that that was, whenever you look at the footnotes. Or a fish, it says it's useless to try to catch a Leviathan with hooks, harpoons, or anything else. Job 41, 1 and 2, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down, that can thou put a hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with a thorn. Can you do that with a crocodile? Yep. Not with a lion, though. Job 41, 7 and 8. Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. In other words, when you battle with him, you're not going to do any more because you're going to be dead. Job 41, 18 and 21. By his kneesings a light does shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go a smoke as out of a seething pot or a cauldron. 
His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of His mouth. You ever heard of a fire-breathing dragon? Job 41, 27, and 34, He esteemeth iron as straw, brass as rotten wood. Arrow cannot make him flee. Sting, uh, sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh the path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary or gray. Upon the earth there is not his like who is made without fear. He beholdeth all things. He's king over all the children of pride. The Leviathan may have been a Chronosaurus or something like that. Chronosaurus, 33 feet, 32, 33 feet long, 7 tons. I think that's a big creature. The blue whale, 98 foot long and 170 tons. Largest creature ever lived. Blue whale. That animal was still around when King David was alive about 1000 B.C. Psalm 124, 26, There go to the ships there that is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. David wrote that. So what happened to the dinosaur? Oh, excuse me, they played with the ships, went to throw. What happened to the dinosaur? Where did they go? Evolutionary science has come up with several theories. The main theory is that a large asteroid hit the earth. Resulting dust cloud choked out the sun and all the dinosaurs died of starvation. That's the main theory on what happened to them. Well, it appears that most dinosaurs died out in the flood. Noah did keep some alive on the ark that were able to thrive in a vastly different world after the flood. You find very few pictures that have dinosaurs going into the ark, but God could have had Noah take in young dinosaurs. They didn't have to be 40 foot tall. They could have been young. And besides that, the ark was 450 foot long, 70 foot, 5 foot wide, and 45 feet tall. They would fit real easily. Well, after the flood, many parts of the world came, became too harsh for dinosaurs. There were deserts, cold, extreme heat, such things as that. But humans and dinosaurs have lived together since the creation week. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you can believe that humans and dinosaurs have been here since the beginning of time about 6,000 years ago. Two Sundays from now, we're going to look at how old is the earth. Jesus created the dinosaurs. He created the humans. And He said humans have been here since the beginning of the creation. Mark 10, 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Talking about men. Man and woman right there. Alright? That's it. If you have any questions or comments, we might have about two or three minutes. I don't know. You are at it soon. I think it's over in New Zealand. Don't they have a commoded, what they call a commoded dragon or something like that? This not New Zealand. I think it's in some popular Yeah, there is well, it, it gets pretty good size. Yeah, it does. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a meat eater, too. If it went for a thousand years, how big would it get? Anybody else? How to Train Your Dragon 2 and How to Train Your Dragon. Stuff like that. It's all about like people riding dragons all around okay. the park and everything. Yeah. I saw a picture of them riding a dragon deadly on there on one of those eight stones. Anybody else? Well, there may be dinosaurs out there that big. They may be just Komodo dragons, things like that too. They live that long. Reptiles continue to grow all their life. Lake Ness. Huh? Lake Ness. The Loch Ness monster. Yeah. I mean, people might just be on a seeing stuff. Yeah. I like what the evolutionists do. Whenever you go and read about stuff like the Ickerstones and that, the evolutionists group that with aliens coming in and starting mankind and stuff like that. But again, whenever you read the evolutionary writings on it. They don't give any references for the proof for the things they say. 
most of the writings that I read, they would say stuff, but they would never reference who did it. But an evolutionist won't want to believe that. They don't want to believe there's a God. Because they'll be held responsible for their actions if there's a God. All right. Anything else? Let's back.